You know what they say, size matters. Well, in polling, sample size matters. But how much? This time on Poll Hub, we're going to get a little wonky and dissect how the number of people polled affects the quality of the end result. But first, the dreamers. The young people first brought to this country illegally by their parents who are now, in most cases, just like every other American their age. Except they're not citizens. In 2012, President Obama gave them a way to get work permits and to stay. This week, President Trump ended that program starting next year. So what do Americans think about this? How do their views on this differ from what they think about illegal immigration in general or building a wall? Well, there's brand new polling here at the Marist Poll that provides some answers. So let's get started. Hi, everybody. Time for Poll Hub. I am J.D. Dapper. I'm Lee Marigoff, director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. And joining us, as always, Barbara Carvalho, director of the Marist Poll. And we're all here at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And we're talking about the dreamers. And the reason is that this week, President Trump rescinded a program that Barack Obama had put into place in 2012 to protect the people, many of whom are young adults, who were brought to this country by their parents who were coming across the border, whatever border, they're not all from South America or Latin America, uh, came illegally. So the kids were here illegally, but the rationale has always been you can't punish a five-year-old for being brought into the country illegally when they're now 25. It's, it's just not fair. That's the rationale. This week, Donald Trump said, well, they still broke the law. And then he said, Congress ought to fix it. But at the end of the day, the program uh, ends in six months. Um, what do Americans think about that? You have been out in the field. You've been asking the yeah, question. Yeah, and I think that there is a consensus among most Americans uh, that they are concerned about what the president has done in his move to end uh, the DACA policy. Um, but... One of the things that is unclear, both in terms of opinion and in terms of polling, is what is going to come next. Um, so what we did is we asked people's opinions about what they thought about what the president did as opposed to any specific um, type of policy or reform or something going forward. And what we found was that a majority of Americans, 56%, disapproved of him moving to end the program. Um, his base, uh, re- you know, most Republicans, um, people who said that they had supported him last November, overwhelmingly approve of what he did. So, Lee, what does that, what does that mean when this large a percentage of, of Americans in general, but this large a percentage of his supporters agree with the move that he made. Well, first, first of all, as he would have said during the campaign, if he went into Fifth Avenue and shot somebody, his supporters would not leave him. And I think to some degree, that's still part of the mystique that Donald Trump has brought to the White House in that people ha- he has this very, very loyal following. And what he's done a lot of uh, in the time he's been president is he's been doing things at the base his core supporters will support. Um, and he promised this on the campaign trail. And he promised it on the campaign trail, although interestingly, he has sort of backed off some of it and encouraged Nancy Pelosi to say, well, but you know, dreamers don't get upset because nothing's really happening. And he may, as you said, revisit this at some point if Congress doesn't act. And now we have a whole group of people, 800,000 approximately, who are for all intents and purposes, Americans, I mean, they've grown up here, they know no other place, are now worrying, can I stay? Will I be able to stay here or am I going to have to leave? So so we have this you know, constant upheaval um, coming out of Washington, which maybe his base wanted to shake things up, but I'm not sure this is all the shaking up that they he, wanted out of mind. Is that at least part of the reason why the majority of Americans don't support what he did is that the, if, as we look at the things that he does week in, week out, a majority of Americans with actions like this uh, seem to not approve of them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that seems yeah. to be a consistent thing at this point. 80 percent, 90 percent of his supporters approve it, and 50-plus percent of Americans yeah. don't approve of these actions. Well, I think also people have a sense that change is coming. There's just not a great sense of what 
that change is and particularly how to think of him. So one of the things that we did see was that instead of the 80 or 90 percent support among his supporters, it's really more around, you know, three, three and four. So you still have, you know, one in four, 25 percent of his supporters or Republicans um, really kind of taking a, a wait and see or not approving of what he's, what and he's ha- done. And how does this compare to the others? Other other organizations have polled uh, on, on DACA uh, and on this decision. Uh, where what have we seen in those, and how do they compare and what's contrast really, you know, with your yeah, numbers? What's, what's, I think what's really interesting is that we find, regardless of the poll methodology, almost regardless of the questions that are being asked, that that everybody's really getting the similar, same kind similar. of you know numbers. That a majority to almost two thirds of Americans, um, you know, want to give dreamers an opportunity. Um, some people use the phrase "pathway to citizenship," which which can be somewhat polarizing. But even in that case, um, we're seeing pretty high numbers of Americans wanting uh, to give dreamers that opportunity. And when some polls actually specify, you know, should it be citizenship? Should it just be that they are allowed to stay here? Should it be work permits? I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, nuances to the issue that have a lot of support. So the Congress definitely has their work cut out for them. Yeah, you know, and think about, I mean, this doesn't come on the scene without a history and without a track record. And I'm thinking back to the so-called autopsy the Republicans did after 2012 when they said we really have to reach out to— voters, Latino voters, and and attract more of them. And then they went about their business not doing that and still were successful. But yet we see in these numbers that, you know, this may not work very well ultimately for an appeal to that group of voters because it's really targeting them. Um, But think about the Republican Party and, you know, we, gosh, Mitt Romney not too long ago was talking about self-deportation as a policy, which I don't think anybody took very seriously. Um, But now you have this and... A lot of folks are sort of of a single mind, recognizing that these polls, ours included, come very close to the announcement itself, and sometimes polls can be influenced by the proximity of that announcement. How so? Well, because people are just sort of getting a sense of what is all about this, and the public opinion may still be forming. People have it hasn't been even clear what this means, other than he's kicked the ball back to uh, along Pennsylvania Avenue back to Congress. The debate hasn't really started, right? And what What interests me here is that um, I, I've looked. You know, we've all looked over this um, period of really four years or eight years. I mean, you can go back all the way to the '80s if you want, but the last eight years, especially, immigration has been really a, a hot button issue. It's been difficult for Democrats because Democrats have actually moved as a party very far towards supporting. immigration immigration rights in ways that it was a very mixed bag in the past. Uh, And Republicans um, have have moved very dramatically uh, in in the opposite direction. Remember, there was the coalition of Democrats and Republicans, Lindsey Graham and John McCain and others who were trying to... Was that the gang of eight or something? Gang of eight. They were trying to cobble together a comprehensive immigration reform. Americans responded, at least Donald Trump supporters, responded very strongly to immigration. It had built the wall, has been the thing we heard at his speeches, and heard again. He was just in Arizona doing it, and they build the wall. They're still saying build the wall. How does this opinion about the, the, the rescission of DACA, how does that compare with how Americans think about building a wall and illegal immigration? Are they, are they two separate? Are we actually able to distinguish those things and say they're different things? Well, it's, interestingly, it's ultimately possible that the end of this may be a positive, issue, a positive resolution to the DACA issue and perhaps money to build the wall. I could see. Yeah, they envision. combine the two. Yeah. But but I'm but I'm, yeah. what I wonder is is Americans' per- perception of this because build the wall has a resonance. Mm-hmm. You know, people scream at it. At, it's you know. a rallying point. And and illegal immigration is a big major issue. One of the biggest issues in this last election and continues to be. Do Americans have different views about broad, just kind of what do you think about illegal immigration and building a wall versus DACA? Is DACA different? Is it because and if it's different, is it because they're productive 
mid twenty citizens who didn't break the law and all that. I mean, where are we? I think so because I think I might take just a polling perspective on this. Um, I think when it comes to immigration, the words that are used in the question can have an impact upon uh, how people respond to the question. And I'm thinking about wording such as you know using uh, undocumented immigrants to illegal aliens. Okay, which uh, some pollsters you know use that different type of wording. In this case, with the dreamers, regardless of the wording that you're using, we're getting very similar numbers. So, for instance, the NBC News survey monkey poll used, used the phrase um, undocumented uh, children from being deported, and they got 64% support. Um, we used um, a children known as dreamers who came with parents to the U.S. illegally, and we got um, 56 percent saying that they similar. supported. So that's th so that's very that's very similar. That's not a you know dramatic change. Although it looks you know it's um, you know it's eight points, but it's still very close, especially on such a polarized issue. Um, and then we take a look at something like um, uh, Morning Consult, who. Um, um, is an online poll like the Survey Monkey poll, um, and they they refer to them as dreamers, as young people who were brought um, to this country with their parents, and they looked at whether they should meet certain requirements or whether they should be allowed to just stay here, citizens or not, or have work permits, and the, the numbers are very similar in terms of support. Because I think in this instance, people know. The, the type of group we're talking about, in other words, regardless of the question wording. But it is important, and I think Barb underscores the point, that in polling, transparency is important so that she can talk about what she just talked about. And as a reporter, you can say, well, what was the wording of one question? Was it different? It was it showing different results. And I think the lesson from a polling standpoint is transparency matters because we can take a look at that. And from a media standpoint, well, in this instance, we're getting very similar responses, even though the mode of data collection may be different, the wording might be slightly different. But if you're getting a similar response from all these different polls, you probably, from a media perspective, have a pretty good degree of confidence that that's sort of what public opinion is. And there's is. support from a majority of Americans on this. I think one of the things that I found really interesting when we were doing our polling, we we listen to people who are speaking to us more than just collecting, collecting the numbers. And a couple of folks actually... Um, wanted to speak with someone else besides the the interviewer who they were speaking with to talk to us about this particular question. And one of the things that they... Um, Is that common? Um, well, yes. Yeah, sometimes people want to comment on our questions and sometimes... And who do you, so who do you send them to? I mean, do they say, I want to speak to your supervisor, like when you get customer support well, they, and you're not getting it? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they have questions about our questions and sometimes they have a better way that they think that they might be able to... Uh, ask the question, or we might be able to ask the question. Um, and sometimes they're a little confused about, well, what's the point we're trying to get at here? And we listen to that because we don't want the question to be confusing, and we want to make sure that everybody's interpreting it in a similar way. And what did you hear this so, time? So on the DACA question, we the, the question itself is DACA, and we define that it's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy uh, that grants temporary legal status to children known as dreamers who came with parents to the U.S. illegally. Legally. Do you approve or disapprove of President Trump's move to end DACA? And what the people uh, that spoke with us, they heard the word illegally. Now, they knew exactly who we were speaking about. As Lee pointed out, they're not, people are not confused on this issue. But they took you know, umbrage with the fact that we said that they were illegal. And so I thought that that was, you know, an interesting take because that's what they heard in the question. Yet when we look at this question compared with questions that didn't refer to them as being illegal, we still get very similar results. We made sure in this question that talking about the DACA people was a distance away in the question wording from the word illegal so that we weren't in some way intimating that those are the folks who are illegal because that would perhaps shape the response. So I think this is a this is an interesting, certainly an emotionally charged issue and one we're going to poll again soon to see if in fact this immediate reaction stays as it is 
people get more supportive of DACA or less supportive as we go down the road. It's kind of an issue that you really want to trend over time because it is a uh, changing issue. It's a volatile issue potentially, and I don't think we've heard the last of it out of Washington. So we want to talk about sample size and um, what that means. Let's start with the poll we just talked about, the, the DACA poll. What was the sample size? How many, and, and what is the sample size in this case? What does that mean? It was, uh, we actually interviewed 519 Americans around the country. Um, and so we then attach uh, an error margin to that, which all survey results are estimates. So every number you see is approximately what would have been gotten as a result had we interviewed everyone in the population. Um, and so that estimate has a range, which we call the margin of error. Um, and you see that as, you know, plus or minus something or other. And in, in this, this instance, instance, it was 4.3. Right. And that means that every answer technically could be 4.3% more or 4.3% less than the number that we're presenting. Right. So let's talk about that sample size, though. 500, what was it? Five, 519. Five, 519. Um, that seems, if I don't know anything about polling and mm -hmm. statistics, I'm going, well, that seems really small. I mean, well, you 519 know I think, people, I think, come on. I think one of the things we might want to just point out here, though, is, well, what exactly is a sample? And so... What's really important in polling is that you're actually taking a sample, think of a blood sample, thinking about, uh, you know, Lee always likes to use, uh, you know, culinary uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, examples. That's not so, a blood sample example. That's the bucket of soup example. Yes, so yes. you like the bucket. So tell what's the okay, bucket of soup so, example. So we'll, the question we'll get, is, we will get away from the blood and get to I'd the like food. To, I like I, that. No, better. I can do both if no, you no. like. Uh, but stick, the, stick with the soup. Okay, stay, we'll stay with the, the soup. So if you have a big bucket of soup and you take a spoon of that, uh, yeah, what does the soup taste like? If you have a huge vat of soup, five times larger than the original one. How do you know what kind of sample, how big a spoon do you have to take to tell me what the soup tastes like? And the answer is about the same. So what the moral for that is for polling methodology is the size of the sample is not necessarily tied directly to the size of the population you're polling. So you can have a small sample and it can tell you an awful lot. So what's a, what's a big sample versus a small sample? So 519... Is this big? Is this small one? That's a small sample. That's a small sample. What would be a big one? When 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 we read polls, we hear about Usually, polls, polls you do. What's a big when when you see a poll and you go, wow, that's a big sample. Usually about a thousand, a little bit well, more than that. Well, a big sample would probably be a couple of thousand people. And some of the online pollsters um, actually interview a very large number of people, two, three thousand people, because they give it a, it gives it a sense of greater credibility. And does it have more credibility because the sample size is 3,000 as opposed to 500? Really. Not you, really. Are, because are, if I go back to Lee's soup example, yeah, if you are taking, if you want to take a sample of this big vat of soup, that's great. But what if you put your spoon in the wrong vat? And that's what happens a lot of times with online polling. We're not really sampling the vat of soup that we want to. Um, we're interviewing people that um, are not necessarily in the population that we're interested in interviewing, or it doesn't include everybody, or has it doesn't allow everyone a chance to participate. It's a different soup. Yeah, different. It's a, it's it's a, a different soup. It's a different mix. So you want to get the right recipe here, but here, here's the answer, I think, as I would approach it. The question is that a bigger sample is not necessarily better, and a smaller sample is not necessarily worse in terms of what you're finding out. What do you know when you get a bigger sample? Well, you can look at subgroups. In the soup example, well, you can see what kind of vegetables are in it. If you don't have a tiny little cup of soup, you might be missing some of the noodles and some of the vegetables that are in there. So if you want to talk about subgroups within the population, then the bigger the sample, the better it is. But Generations, to, Democrats, Republicans, independents. To go back to Barb's example, that if you interview lots and lots of people, you better make sure you're picking the right people or the numbers are going to get more distorted. So if you're not sampling the right vat of soup, to continue the analogy, it's going to get worse and worse in terms of your conclusion, even if you interview 10,000 people as opposed to 500 because you're not picking them randomly or whatever you need to be doing in that particular situation. You know, situation. one of the really good examples of this is um, when we look at um, – 
politics. And we're trying to understand elections, particularly in primaries or um, when a state is going to have a caucus. Um, in, in New York City uh, this year, we're going to have, um, you know, a mayoralty election. Um, and there are, New York City is made up mostly of Democrats. So to find Republicans in New York City is a really tough thing to do because there are only about, you know, one in 10 of, of, the, of the registered voters in the city. So um, if we have a handful of Republicans, and when handful in, in polling means, you know, 100 or 200 people that we've randomly selected throughout the city, even though that's a small sample, um, we're st we still have a really good understanding of what that group of, of individuals yeah, thinks. And, and, and I, I, I remember that from, from covering you guys when there was Republican primaries. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you guys like just looking out the window going, how the heck are we going to do this? You have to find a Republican, you have to, not only do you have to find a couple of hundred Republicans, you, there were three people, I think, running in that primary. So you had to find which ones are going to vote for which. You're down to like six people saying you're going to vote for mm -hmm. somebody. But if That's it's done scientifically... And if it's done with the chance of most Republicans having a likelihood of being in your sample or you reaching them, then statistically, it's actually quite valid. One of my favorites is the Iowa caucus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Where nobody, I mean, people think it's this, this big thing, and then you find out that. 14,000 people statewide or 20,000 mm -hmm. statewide in a state of mil 3 million people mm -hmm. participated. Exactly. How do you pull that? And it's really tough. And so in the past, we've seen people who aren't too familiar with polling Iowa go into the state with these large sample sizes and they have, you know, a thousand Democrats and a thousand Republicans and they're going to tell us who is gonna, who's going to win each caucus. And then you have the Iowa poll which has been done um, with the Des Moines Register and is a very accurate, scientifically uh, done poll, and they have 50 likely Democrats. And everybody questions whether you can make any conclusion from that number, and absolutely you yeah. could. But, but 50, and they 50, were very accurate. 50 Democrats out of only 20,000 that are going to show up, or whatever the number is, is actually a bigger sample than a million people goes to the polls when you only have 1,000 well, people in the sample. Well, what they so. did was they took the whole pool of Democrats, and then they asked them questions about whether they've you know, caucused in the past, whether they are likely to caucus this time, if they're supporting, you know, a candidate. So they asked a number of questions to find out whether yeah. those were the people that were going to actually show up. So they did start with a similar pool of Democrats, um, but they asked questions to find out and, who was likely to And this is the poll up. that got Barack Obama right in 2008, yes. mm -hmm. and, and it has gotten ma it's, it's many, many, good, many results. It's right. a yeah. very good, yeah. reputable, very good but, solid, but, accurate okay, poll. What are we talking about right now? We're talking about a real statistical, scientific basis to polls. We're talking about the numbers and the margin of error and how precise a poll can be. Um, when you do polls, though, you move fairly quickly from the science side and to the art of doing polls. And what Barbara and I think you were talking about, Jay, um, you start with a certain size, the number of people maybe in the population. You then talk about registered voters. Then you were interested in likely voters. Well, how you define the likely voter may vary from poll to poll to poll, which is why sometimes polls show a different result when they're measuring presumably the same thing. So it's important also not everybody has to know how an organization defines its likely voter, but to understand that that's no copyright. There's no copyright there. There's no magic behind that. It's the organization and their expertise and their experience and their abilities which are defined that. And if I have a great poll and I interview 500 people and I have an error margin of, let's say, four and a half, and I have great questions, sample was drawn right, interviews were done correct, correctly, the, the analysis was done well, error margin is, let's say, four and a half percent. If I have a poll where the sample was drawn badly and the questions were not well written and the interviewing wasn't done very well and the analysis wasn't very clear, same number of interviews, 500, margin of error, the exact same, four and a half. So margin of error tells you something, but it doesn't tell you the whole picture. So I think that, the, the, look, what, what I take from this is that as somebody who is interested in polls, and there's a lot of people, at least from what I see on Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere, there's tons of people, tons of armchair analysts now who are looking at polls and, and look at polls a lot, is that everybody 
needs to look at more than one poll, needs to look at how the poll was done. You don't have to go into the details, but look, are they looking at likely voters? Are they looking at registered voters? Big difference. Uh, and again, compare and contrast polls before saying, well, this poll shows this, it must be true. But we're going to talk- also, And also, don't get nickel and dimed, meaning don't look at the, at the bigger sample size and think that it's better. Right. Now, or worth more. And also in this instance, don't just take two polls and average them and then say, all right, somewhere in the middle. Because if you stick your head in the freezer or you light your feet on a fire, you're going to have a very different body temperature. But your average could be 98.6. That kind of takes us back to the soup somehow, but I'm not <laughs> sure how. So let's just uh, ponder the soup as uh, for now. And that's it for this edition of Poll Hub. Uh, Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll here at Marist College in Poughkeepsie. And our executive producer is Mary Griffith. And if you have any questions you would like us to ponder, we'd love to hear from you at pollhub at marist.edu. And of course, you can check out Poll Hub on social media at Marist Poll on Twitter, Marist Poll on Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. And please don't forget to subscribe. And eat soup. Ha, ha, ha.